this is a study that we felt like was important because of um, the state of our nation and the very overt ways in which um, conservative Christianity has um, steered some political agendas in our nation over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, it's reached a point where it feels irresponsible for those of us who are Christians who have different perspectives on politics to be silent or passive. It's time for us to um, consider what an appropriate response is and how we can articulate our faith and the ways that our faith informs our participation in our society. So understanding how we got where we are is the first step of figuring out what our way forward is together. Michelle, you can take us to the next slide. So we will gather tonight with prayer. I have a candle lit behind me and you are welcome to have a candle lit in your space or otherwise um, hold your space in a way that is sacred. Breath of God breath of life, breath of deepest yearning. Come, Holy Spirit. Comforter, disturber, interpreter, inspirer. Come, Holy Spirit. Heavenly friend, lamp lighter, Revealer of truth, midwife of change. Come, Holy Spirit. God is here. God's Spirit is with us. We want to take a moment each night that we gather to review the conversation covenant that we have asked people to um, pledge to in our time together. So we will review briefly here that we pledge to act in good faith. This means to interpret one another's comments in ways that are gracious and kind and give each other the benefit of the doubt. We pledge to speak truth and seek truth. This means relinquishing the need to win an argument and instead approaching our conversation and each other's experiences with curiosity and openness. We pledge to respect each other and ourselves. This means that we will honor the differences that each of us brings to the table and that we will also respect ourselves by not apologizing for things that we didn't do. Um, and finally, we will take responsibility for the quality of the discussion, which means that we will remind people of these pledges that we have made if we feel like someone's participation isn't in keeping with it, and that we will continue to adhere to these principles even if other people are not. and a review of the tools that we have available to manage our conversation. So the raised hand reaction at the bottom of your screen, there's a little smiley face. And when you click on that, there is the option to raise your hand. You can also use other reactions if you want to respond to someone's comments, but don't feel the need to say a whole sentence. We will use that raised hand reaction, especially in the last 30 minutes when we will be doing a conversation as a whole group, but it can also be useful in the breakout rooms. The chat box is a little speech bubble that says chat along the bottom of your screen. And the default setting is to send a message to everyone. So if you have resources that you wanna share or comments for everyone, you can put those in the chat to everyone. 
Um, you also have the option, if you click on that rectangle box that says everyone, you can pick a specific person to send a message to directly. So if you need to communicate to me or to our Zoom tech person, um, our breakout room specialist, Monica, you can find us there and send direct messages. Um, we will be drawing any resources that you all share in the chat out and we'll include those in an email at the end of the week as we did last week. And finally, um, one of our tools is always to pay attention to our own needs. That means taking a break to use the bathroom or get a drink of water whenever you need to do that. It means stepping away if you're feeling overwhelmed or exhausted, giving yourself the space that you need um, to be able to care for any emotions that might emerge. Um, and Caroline and I both are available for folks if you discover that something in the conversation dredges up very big feelings for you or a memory that you want help processing. Caroline and, our, and I are available both immediately following the discussion tonight, but also at other times during the week if you would like an opportunity to follow up later on. Um, so all of that is part of how we care for ourselves and each other. Well, Sarah, <clears throat> thank you for opening us today. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm Michelle Gossman. I'm a deacon at the Congregational Church. Um, I'm also someone who's very concerned about the ways in which um, our society appears to be getting fractured. And I put a little you are here arrow on my slide tonight because we're in our second session and the theme tonight is security. And I think um, in the chapters that we've looked at for tonight, uh, they are replete with examples of people who are not feeling secure in their responses to the culture. Um, as Sarah mentioned, if you find some things that are particularly difficult to process, please reach out. You are not alone. This is not meant to, um, uh, to be a torture. It may be an eye opener and we are here to work with you in that process of unpacking what's, what, uh, what is in this book. And there is much. Um, so practice good self-care, as Sarah mentioned. So I entitled this tonight, Security or the Lack Thereof, a long history of fearful reactions to social change. Um, fearful reactions to social change are pretty normal, but evangelical Christians who are struggling to hold back modernity have a particularly long history of fear-based reactions. This is nothing new, but seems to be increasing in frequency and scope in, in uh, recent years. So fear not is one of the most commonly um, most of the com most common instructions in the Bible, but Professor John Fay, who's a professor of American history at Messiah College, um, said the history of evangelicalism is the story of a people failing miserably at overcoming fear with hope, trust, and faith in God. Um, and he's laid out several examples of where this is, has come from. It's not new. So what I'm going to do now is give you the, uh, a very brief history of fear-based reactions in Christianity. So we can start in the 17th century in Salem because the witch trials, uh, which I always thought were burnings at the stake, but that's not true. They were hung. 19 people were hung as the result of fear that arose from Christians who thought that these particular pe people, for whatever reason, uh, were um, going to impact their, their ability to be that shining city on the hill. So an example of religious fear. In the 19th century, there were, there were waves of ant or Catholic um, immigrants that were coming here from across the world and Catholics were persecuted often violently 
Um, they were not noticed so much in earlier years, but as large numbers came from Germany and um, Italy and Ireland, people were uh, reacting rather violently. In 1800, the election of godless Thomas Jefferson, remember he wrote his own Bible, um, had several, several New England communities concerned that Jefferson or his henchmen would march into their, ride into their towns, throw up in their doors and confiscate their Bibles. And these are, I mean, I'm saying this with a, like a hint of irony in my voice, but these were real concerns of people at the time, people that were acting out of fear to protect their religious beliefs. Um, the antebellum South was a culture built on brutal slavery. Um, this picture depicts a, sl a slave rebellion, but in truth, slave rebellions were extremely rare. But they're in a culture where white enslavers were often vastly outnumbered by the enslaved. And the enslavers lived in constant fear due to the moral injury that they bore. In the early, early 20th century is when the fundamentalist movement arose in the United States and the fundamentalist movement was stridently anti-Catholic so much so that they paired with the Ku Klux Klan to guard the white Protestant character of the United States. Evangelical anxiety intensified post-World War II. So we see that little image of, of the person fully in the light starting to move down the stairs and getting all the way into the darkness. And those that kind of a movement has continued um, and what, what ramped things up after World War II? There were court cases that basically banned Bible uh, reading in public schools, prayers in public schools. Um, there was a wave of non-European migration. So now there were people from many different faith traditions and none at all that were coming here. Um, the Christian schools along with public schools were uh, ordered to be desegregated. There was a sense that patriarchal power was being diminished and abortion was legalized. So there were many things that we would consider kind of hot bus button issues that started to arise in this period of time. So what's happening now? Evangelicals continue to re react to a fear of societal decay by railing against these tools of the devil. And we know what they are, welfare, communism, or you will hear socialism today a lot, divorce, public schools, homosexuality, women's rights, reproductive rights. And there are a host of others that you can probably imagine. This was something I think that deeply impacted the Christian right the election of Barack Obama. Um, he was biracial. His father was a Muslim. He spent time living in a Muslim nation. His name was funny, but his middle name was Hussein. Um, he started out uh, with one opinion on the Defense of Marriage Act and changed his mind much to the chagrin of more conservative folks. And there were people that were just completely baffled by the fact that this man who came from rather modest means ended up in Harvard and the thought was, why can't I? So there were many things about Barack Obama that just really rocked the world of some of the folks in the evangelical communities. And underneath much of that fear, I think is the stain of racism in America. So evangelicals are folks who are trying to work to further the kingdom of God in the world. But fear results in actions that are diametrically opposed to a faithful response. So which approach is more aligned with furthering God's work in the world? 
the approach of faith or the approach of fear. And I'll just give you a minute to look at those. So in the faith column, you will see teachings that are right out of scripture. So we've talked a lot about fear, fear. And what does fear do to us? So it triggers that fight or flight reaction that mobilizes us for action. You know, blood goes to our muscles so we can run. Um, it releases a flood of all kinds of chemicals, hypothalamic, pituitary, and adrenal hormones that the nerves deliver to all parts of our bodies almost instantly. It's just truly amazing um, that this system is put in place, but it's put in place to protect us. It impedes our ability to reason. The autonomous part of our brain, which is the, they call it, sometimes call it the reptilian brain because it's the very oldest piece of our brain. It's the, the core that's down here and then all the newer material wraps around it. So that's the part of our brain that keeps the functions we don't even think about most of the time going, like uh, breathing and those sorts of things. Um, but when that happens, our prefrontal cortex, which is the seat of rational thought, is out of the loop, literally out of the loop, because it's outside of the flow of all of these um, chemicals and uh, processes that our body is undergoing at the time. Fear restrains our creativity and our playfulness, which are both things that we need to be able to figure things out and get along with others. And fear is the piece that sets the stage for not being ourselves. We've all had that experience at one time or another. We've all been in fear at one time or another. But when we're seeing this on a massive scale, it's a bit startling. So what can we do to dismantle fear in ourselves and in others? They say that being able to feel safe with other people is the most important aspect of health, be it mental or physical, and I'm convinced they're tied together. So as a culture, one of the things we can do is basically Teach civics, you know, teach people that we're all in this together and it's a we rather than a me. Last time, the second point was mentioned, education. Learn about other people and other cultures and other traditions because once you start to know about them, it's harder to demonize them and harder to be afraid of them. In our families <clears throat> or in our communities, a reciprocity is really, really important. The ability to be seen and heard and to see and hear others. Um, if you come into difficult conversations, develop a skill for reframing with wise questions. I know um, um, a sister I know comes back with questions like, well, tell me more about how you've come to that. So rather than judge or condemn or act startled, she could just looks directly at them kindly and asks, tell me more how you've come to that in a way that inspires more conversation. In our families and in other places, keep the connections. Um, this can be really challenging if we have people that have opinions um, that are very, very different than ours, who, who carry a, a sense of reality that's very different than ours. You can keep the connection. You don't need to condone the actions, but the connection is very important. And develop skills of emotional intelligence, to be able to be present to people, to ask questions, to res respond rather than react.
So I'd like to extend an invitation for the coming week for everyone. When things come up, if you watch the news, if you have a conversation, if there's something that you're aware of where there's a kind of a raw edge, be aware of where fear is creating reactions instead of responses. It may be in you. It may be in someone that you're interacting with. You may be seeing it in the broader culture, but just look at those things and try to be aware of where fear may be in there or how fear may be influencing the situation. If it's a per interpersonal uh, interaction, consider responding with reasoned calm and genuine caring. Practice using those non-judgmental open questions and listen deeply because knowing what we're fe we feel is the first step to knowing why we feel that way. And it also informs us about others. So does that sound like a exercise that we might all be able to do at least? I mean, I'm not talking about sitting down with a pencil and paper and taking hours to do this. I'm talking about kind of on the fly. <laughs> So we all have some questions that we've been provided with to be able to consider in breakout rooms. But before we go to breakout rooms, I did a kind of a, um, a quick run through of fear-based reactions throughout Christianity, especially evangelical Christianity what fear does to us and how we might be able to recognize fear in ourselves and others and manage it appropriately. Does anybody have any questions before we go to the breakouts? And don't put them in the chat because I can't see the chat right now. I have too many other things going on my screen. Margie shared in the chat that taking deep breaths can sometimes help you um, manage that fear before you respond to someone. That's an excellent point, Margie. And in fact, if you breathe in slowly through your nose and even more slowly through your mouth, there's evidence that physiologically that slows you down. Good point. Anyone else? Um, Michelle, I had, this is Caroline. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's been helpful to me is um, when I'm when I'm feeling usually judgmentalism in me is an indication that I'm feeling fearful about something. I'm trying to protect something of myself, um, and so the the switch for me is to work at feeling curious rather than judgmental, right. um, and to think about. What is it that might have brought this person to where they are? That question. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that I'm feeling that is is making me feel um, anxious or or judgmental or fearful in this moment? But but asking yourself questions and and using curiosity actually can help move you out of the reptilian brain and into your prefrontal cortex because it it uses a different part of your brain to be curious than it does to be fearful. Excellent point, Caroline. It opens up those channels so your prefrontal cortex can become can become more active again. 